Turn our Bibles to Colossians chapter number 2. Colossians chapter number 2. Colossians chapter number 2, and uh, I'm going to read the entire chapter. You can follow along silently while I read, starting verse number 1. The Bible reads, For I would that ye knew what great conflict I have for you, and for them at Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. For though I be absent in the flesh, yet am I with you in the spirit, joying and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up, built up in him, and established in the faith as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind, and not holding the head from which all the body by joints and bands, having nourishment, ministered and knit together increaseth with the increase of God. Wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why, as though living in the world, are ye subject to ordinances, touch not, taste not, handle not, which all are to perish with the using, after the commandments and doctrines of men, which things have indeed a show of wisdom and will worship, and humility and neglecting of the body, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for this opportunity to preach. God, I pray that you would please just fill me with your spirit tonight and with your power, dear Lord, that I would preach a message that would be pleasing to you, dear God, and that would come from the truth of your word and not just uh, my own opinions, dear Lord, but I pray that you would please just help us all to learn tonight and just to listen uh, intently as your words preach. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. All right, now the part of the chapter I want to focus here in Colossians chapter 2 is starting in verse number 4. We'll read that again in verse number four. The Bible reads, And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. For though I be absent in the flesh, yet am I with you in the spirit, joying and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. And what this, what this sermon's going to be about tonight, and it's got a funny title to the sermon, but, but to the sermon, bear with me. The title of my sermon is Jesus is Not an Anarchist. Okay, now a lot of you might not, um, you know, be on board with that whole philosophy and the whole train of thought, but... Um, you know, I, that, that's something I've been following quite a bit. My political views have changed. And this, this sermon's going to be a little bit political in nature, but not completely. So, I mean, I, you should be able to get something out of this. Um, and in Colossians 2, verse 4, it says, be, you know, basically to beware lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. 
You don't, you, you, we always got to beware that people are going to come to you with, with words that sound really good, that sound really pleasing, you know, that, that sound like, hey, man, that's good. I want to follow that. But he says, beware lest they beguile you. Beguile is tricking you, right? They're deceiving you. They're tricking you with, with enticing words. And then in verse 8, he says, beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy. See, we always want to make sure that, that what we believe and the things that we stick to and the things that we believe come from God's word, not just from philosophy, not just vain to see, not just what man's opinion is and what man thinks. Because I'll tell you what, um, you know, there's a lot of different opinions out there about how our government should run, about, about, you know, all the different politics and everything else like that. But what we need to do is get our view from the Bible of what God wants us to do, how we ought to set up our human government and the way we ought to live our lives. And the, the way the structure should be ought to come from the Bible, not just come from a philosophy or from just the wisdom of man. It needs to come from the Bible. And we need to watch out for this now. I mean, me personally, you know, my background, when I first got, got started back into church, I was saved when I was 20 years old. But, um, you know, around 2007, there's, you know, some changes in my life. And, and I started going to Faithful Word and I really started... Um, growing tremendously. That's where I got baptized. And that's when I really decided, you know what, I'm going to start living for God. And, I, and I'm going to change my life and start doing things different. And it was also around that time, probably within the first year that I was going to church there, that my political views were changing too. And you know, when you, when you get on board, you want to start doing good things. You want to start doing what's right. You really want to start, you know, I, at least I did. I want to start making a change in the world. I wanted to start doing something good. I wanted to, to change the way things are going. It's, it doesn't take, uh, especially these days, it doesn't take much to look around and see that the world is in really bad shape yes. and, and that there's a lot of wickedness, there's a lot of bad things going on. And I started thinking about, you know what, maybe I should get into politics and that way, you know, you can make some big changes because you have this idea thinking like, well, if I could become a senator or, or a governor or, or, you know, a representative or something like this, I could get into this government and start making changes that way. And, um, you know, I started growing and learning more that way. But I came to the realization that the politics ultimately are going to mean nothing. Yeah. You need to get to the heart of man. You need to get to the heart of the individuals. And uh, it doesn't matter what our government is. If you can get the people to start living righteously, yeah. you could have the best government in the world. I mean, you could have the most, like the least amount of government, the, you know, the most free, the most liberty. And if the people are going to be living in sin, if the people are going to go off and, and forget God and just do whatever they want to do, guess what? God's going to judge us and he's going to bring us into bondage and the politics are going to mean nothing. Yeah. You could fight against God all you want, but he's going to make sure that that judgment's going to come. So it didn't take too long for me to come to that realization that, hey, you know what? God is true, and, and the, the best impact that any of us can have is going out and reaching the people and try to get them right with God. Obviously, first and foremost, getting them saved. And then, not just getting them saved, but get them living in a righteous life. Because even a group of saved people, if you all decide to just forsake God and start getting into sin and start doing everything, everything else, He'll still bring His judgment upon you, and you'll still go into bondage. Now, um, like I mentioned earlier, though, I, I follow a lot of these different activists. I still have this interest in politics. You know, my, I'll confess my sin to you guys now. It's, it's something that, 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 I, that I listen to and that I'm interested in. So I listen to a lot of guys, and they come from this, this anarchist philosophy. And before you freak out, if you're not you know, too aware of it, anarchist is basically, it doesn't mean no law, but it is, 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 is basically no government, no, no, no one else... Um, you know, ruling and making up these, these rules. And they have a lot of good philosophy. You can listen to them and you can listen to their, to their you know, the way that they bring forth their arguments and say that, um, you know, the government is tyrannical and, you know, no one should be ruling over you and everything else like that. But, um, you know, there's, there's definitely some fundamental flaws and I'm going to uncover some of those tonight in their, in their philosophies and their principles. And what was really irritating is you listen to these guys and you try to, you know, I, I like being educated. I like knowing what's going on in the world and, and hearing these different views. And the one thing that's appealing to it is the, it, with their philosophy is just liberty and freedom. And, you know, the Bible promotes liberty and freedom a great deal. We need to be free. We ought, you know, there's a good value to that. But, and that's what's enticing when you listen to that stuff. But you need to be worried that you're not beguiled by this. And what's really frustrating is when you hear people 
and, and they'll call in or they'll talk to these guys who are, who are you know, the voices of these movements, of these freedom movements and libertarian movements. And it's like they're making excuses for the Bible and they're Christians and they're trying to say, oh, yeah. And they try to basically mold the Bible into the principles of this libertarianism. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's a shame. It really is a shame because you know what you ought to be standing on and what you ought to be bold about. Say, you know what? No, I believe the Bible and some of your beliefs just happen to coincide with what the Bible teaches. But I'll tell you what, when your beliefs don't match up with what this book says, this book is the truth and I'm not going to make any apologies for that. Yeah. Now, the title of my sermon was Jesus is not an anarchist. And I've heard a lot of Christians try to say, you know what? I think Jesus really, you know, he doesn't want you to be under this tyrannical rule, which is true. He doesn't want us to be under a tyrannical rule. But it doesn't mean he doesn't want us to be under any rule at all. And I'll tell you what Jesus believes in. Jesus believes in a monarchy. He doesn't believe in just absolutely no government. The Bible says in Isaiah 43, 15, it says, I am the Lord, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. In Mark 1, 14, the Bible says, Now after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching gospel of the kingdom of God and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Matthew 21, 4 says, All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Sion, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee, meek, and sitting upon an ass, and a colt, the foal of an ass. Jesus Christ is the king. God is the king. And that is the government. That is what God, what Jesus believes in. He doesn't believe in no rulers. And that's exactly what the anarchist movement believes. If you sum it up, they don't want to have any rulers. And what you'll find out, especially in that movement, is a lot of people are atheists. And they have these views and they don't believe in God. And that gets down right to the heart of the matter is that they don't want anybody ruling over them. They don't want God ruling over them. They don't want man ruling over them. They want anybody ruling over them. They want to just do whatever. They want to do whatever comes into their heart to do. And that is the fundamental flaw and the fundamental problem of that is that, no, we need to have God as our ruler. And it doesn't even make any sense because you think, you, you know, these people come up with a philosophy and it's, you know, there's the non-aggression principle. Well, they'll say, which, and these things make sense. Don't get me wrong. You know, I'm not just against everything that they're saying, but I want to point out these flaws because, you know, I don't want anyone else to get beguiled by, by the, you know, this through man's philosophy. And they'll say, you know, that, you know, there's this non-aggression principle and you shouldn't um, aggress against other people, which is, which is true. You shouldn't. And, and that's the way that we ought to live our lives. And it's a voluntary type of society. Hey, I'm all for that, you know, doing things voluntarily, not, not forcing people to do things against their will. That sounds great. But you see, they're, they're where they come up with their morals you know, ultimately, if they don't have God to rely on, if they don't have God to say, hey, this is why this is the truth. You know, it's coming from God. It's coming from our creator. It's coming from the person that created us. Then you could talk all day long, but who's to say that your belief is any better than anyone else's? Ultimately, I mean, you have no standing. You have no backing. Now, you might be able to persuade people and convince them into thinking that, hey, the way that I'm talking about this is better than anyone else's. But you can't say that this is the truth. You can't say that this is the way things ought to be and, um, you know, with any authority. It would just ultimately boils down to your opinion. But when we have God's word to stand on, it, you know, it's, um, we, we know that it's the truth. And that's the way that things ought to be. In, uh, in Luke 1.33, um, or in Luke 1.32, it says, He shall be great, talking about Jesus, and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever and ever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. And then in, um, and I'm not going to go through the rest of these verses, basically calling Jesus Christ the King. But um, we, we need to have that higher authority to determine what is right and what is wrong. God's the one that decides what's right and wrong. God's the one that decides our morality to us. It's not just from man. And, um, you know, atheists like to take an argument like this and they'll say, well, that's why, you know, God, like man created this idea of God to give him authority to do things. And they've got it completely backwards. And it's, no, the fact that God exists is, is why I believe in God. It's not because I need a God to justify what I believe. 
God is. God exists. He's true. And um, I don't need that to satisfy some justification for my actions. It's actually the atheist who wants to justify their sinful actions by saying that there is no God. It's the exact opposite. Now, uh, so, so what is the proper government? I believe that um, God's law and judges to lead the people in following God's law. That's what he's created. God is the rule giver. God is the king. God has given us all of the laws that we need to have in our life. He's put them right here in this book. Right. We have God's law to follow today. And that is all morality. This is where all of our decision making should be. What's right and what's wrong comes from the pages of this book. And what he's ordained is for us to have judges to lead the people and to, to, to help direct and, and to... Um, determine what is right and what is wrong based on God's law. God is the lawgiver. God is the king. And he decides what, what is right for us. And he gives us, he has instituted people that would rise up, people that would judge and rule the people. And um, he actually even appointed, you know, for, for families, he's appointed authority in the family with the father. And um, even going back, you think of the tribes of Israel, there were heads and captains over, over different varying groups. And um, they all had authority, but see, it all rested in God's law. It wasn't just to make up some random laws like, like you need to keep your grass trimmed down to this height and not up to here. You know, that, that's not what God ordained the authority for. He gave them the authority to execute his word and to, and to judge appropriately um, when people would break God's laws or, or transgress against one another. And that's, that's ultimately how... Um, how we ought to be dealing with things. And, and that is a very minimal government, by the way. That is an extremely minimal government. We don't need to have, you know, 100,000 laws on the book in addition to God's law. Right. right? I don't think there's a person alive that knows all of the laws that are written down into the laws, the ordinances, and all those things in his land. There's just too many. And we've gotten into a, got ourselves into a place where there are all these laws because of all the wickedness that abounds because people have strayed from God. Amen. And um, there's a scripture I'm going to read from you from 1 Samuel chapter 8. And this is when the, uh, the children of Israel, they desired to have a king. They wanted to have someone to rule over them. They wanted to, to, to be like all the other nations round about them. You see, because up to that point, they were different. They were different from the heathen. They were different from the nations round about them. They had God's law and they had judges. But in 1 Samuel chapter 8, we're going to see what happens here when they desired to have a king. Look at verse number 4, 1 Samuel 8, if, you, if you're there. Um, the Bible says, Then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together and came to Samuel unto Ramah and said unto him, Behold, thou art old and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people and all that they say unto thee. For they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me that I should not reign over them. And that goes down to the heart of the matter. Right? The people did not want to have, ultimately, it's not that, that they wanted a king because they didn't like Samuel or they didn't like the way that Samuel led or anything like that. They wanted a king because ultimately they just didn't want God to reign over them. You know, God, Samuel was displeased because he knew, hey, that's not what you guys should be doing. You should not be appointing a king to rule over you. And he gives them this admonition. Look, the king is going to take the best of your land. The king is going to take your sons and he's going to do all this stuff. And you're going to be taxed and you're going to have all these problems that are going to arise. You're going to end up being less free when you have this king. And he was disappointed that they decided to go through with this and, they, and that they wanted to institute this to be like all the heathen lands. But God tells Samuel, said, look, don't, you know, don't worry about it. They haven't rejected you because Samuel was a judge of Israel at that time. He was the main judge of Israel at, at, at this time. But he says, they haven't rejected you. They rejected me. And this is what happens when, when, a, when a group of people don't want to have God reigning over them. They're going to get themselves into wickedness. They're going to get themselves you know, into these form of governments or whatever that, that are going to be oppressive. And they are going to end up being oppressed because they don't want to have God reigning over them. And this is, this is the biggest problem that I've found with the people in the, in the anarchist movement and in the, 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 the hardcore libertarian movement 
is um, that they don't want to have anybody ruling over them. And that includes God. And that, that is the number one problem with that. When you don't want to have God ruling over you, you're in for serious pro trouble. Amen. You're in for a serious problem. The Bible says um, in Luke 19, verse 12, you don't have to turn there, it says, He said, therefore, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. This is Jesus Christ giving a parable. And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a message after him, saying, We will not have this man to reign over us, but those mine enemies... Or, I'm sorry, so they, I'm jumping ahead here in my notes, it's kind of hard to see. Luke 19, 12 through uh, 14, you know, it's a, it's a parable of, this, of um, this, this man, he goes off into a far country to go receive a kingdom and he's coming back. It's obviously a parable that's talking about Jesus Christ that's going to come back with his kingdom to rule and reign on this earth. And he tells his servants, he's saying, okay, look, I want you to occupy, I want you to win souls, I want you to, to do, be, be profitable for me while I'm gone. But some of the people hated him. It says some of his citizens hated him. They sent a message saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. Right? So we're going to see what happens to those people that want to have no rulers. They don't want to have God to rule over them. In verse 27 of Luke 19, he finishes up the parable. He says, but those mine enemies, which would not that I should reign over them, bring hither and slay them before me. You see, there is a king. Whether you don't want to have a king, whether you don't want to have anyone to rule over you, there is somebody that is in charge. It's God Almighty. He's real. He exists. And, and as much as you want to wish him away, you can't. And I'm not, I know you guys don't want to wish him away, but, but you know, people in general, you, you can't, you know, if you want to have no rulers, you have to at least submit yourself to the authority of God. And um, now, like I mentioned earlier, you know, just because you know, Jesus was not an anarchist. It doesn't mean that, that the Bible does not promote liberty. It doesn't promote freedom because it absolutely does. As I mentioned earlier, you know, though God's, um, what God has ordained for us to live by is his law and his rules. And to just judge righteously according to these rules. This is not very oppressive at all. This is not required, you know, all these taxes and everything else. And, and to be brought under bondage and to get permission to, to, to cast a hook into the water, to get, to get fish out of you know, the, the, the rivers that God created, or, or to go out and, and hunt animals or do anything like that. You know, God is not designed that you need to get permission from man or permission from government to do these things. He does want us to be free. He does want us to have liberty. Only in the Lord, though, and only according to His laws and His rulers. And, um, but... but because of the amount of freedom that, it, that, he, um, that he espouses and that he loves, that's the reason why I even listen to these people and, and get involved with that at all. And um, they tend to place a value on individual freedom, which is a very common theme of the Bible. And, you know, being free from bondage, having free will, and, um, you know, being responsible for yourself ultimately and being responsible for your family. And uh, so don't, don't let these people, you know, deceive you or, or kind of fool you with their philosophy because a lot of it will sound good and it, you know you could apply this to, it's not just with politics it's with anything when, when you start hearing a lot of philosophies and and it's it's easy to, to relate it to politics because it that's pretty much all it is is just you know man's philosophies and stuff when they're when they don't believe the bible but uh, you could hear a lot of things that sound good and they sound real good and they and they, and they have um you know a lot of logic and you could follow it and it makes a lot of sense. But what you always have to be aware of is if that strays from what the Bible says, you know, this is truth. Amen. This is the ultimate final authority in what we believe and, um, and also what we should be teaching others. So uh, my recommendation, and I don't know if there's anyone else out there like me that, that you know, had an interest in politics and changing people, but um, the best way, and I believe this firmly, otherwise I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing and, and pastor in a church, is because this is the way that you're going to invoke any type of change. The politics can follow later. If you get through to the hearts of the people, if you could change people's lives and get them right with God, hey, when they're right with God, they'll start 
being able to see what the right choices are anyways and not be bamboozled into, into just, just voting for people, thinking that like, hey, you know, whatever you're gonna give me, that's, that's, that's what I'm gonna do. You know, I'm, I'll vote for you, you can buy my vote, or whatever it is. If you could get people right with God, they'll be able to start seeing for themselves. That'll all work itself out. If you just start to invoke your own political rules on people whose hearts aren't right with God, you're going to go nowhere. Yeah. So the, the best thing for us to do is to, is to go out, go soul winning, reach the individuals, not just soul win them. Decide, try, try to bring them into church, follow up with them and get them on the right path and, and really teach them God's word and to reach their hearts so that we can just continue to reach more and more people. Well, let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for this opportunity to preach tonight. God, I thank you for enlightening my mind to, to not waste my time with, with all the political nonsense, dear Lord. But uh, I pray that you would please help us, all of us here as your servants, dear Lord, to go out, to reach people, to, to really get through to their hearts, dear Lord, and to preach your word so that your word can, can really be the, the powerful um, stimulant in, in people's hearts to get them right with you, dear Lord. I pray that you please help us to learn your word, meditate on it, that we could be more effective in, in going out and reaching people. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.